welcome everybody to our inaugural, inaugural lecture, okay? Um, I'm David Donkey, Chair of the Department of Communication, and I just want to say a few things about, um, to start us off before we turn over to our, our uh, distinguished speaker for today. Today we're instituting a new tradition in the Department of Communication. Kirsten Foote, thank you Kirsten, brought this idea to the faculty after seeing a version of it at another university. Was that, where was that at? Canada. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, I was in Canada, right? We're borrowing from our Canadian friends here. Um, we call it, we've decided to call it here the inaugural lecture. And it is a public and at least partly autobiographical lecture given by a faculty member who has been recently promoted to the positions of professor or principal lecturer. The aims of this lecture series are fourfold. The first is to, to, uh, excuse me, to celebrate these very significant promotions, just to do that in a public way and as a community. The second, the an aim is to honor, to honor the ideas, um, the varieties of scholarship, the decades of intellectual engagement that recently promoted professors and principal lecturers have demonstrated, and the people who have inspired and encouraged not often we just kind of step down the hall and say, so tell me of your autobiographical journey, okay? <laughs> so this is a, a formal space to do that. And fourth, to share insights gained along the road to full professorship and principal lectureship from the speaker with colleagues and with graduate students who might benefit from those. Now these are not obligatory talks. It's at the discretion of a faculty member whether to give an inaugural lecture upon that promotion. Mia Ceccarelli will be our first, and I will introduce her in just a moment. Before that, um, I want to say thank you to Judy Howard, the College of Arts and Sciences Divisional Dean for the Social Sciences, for attending today's lecture, and ask her, Judy, if you might say a word or two. Well, I, um, first of all, I'm grateful to Kirsten and David for uh, doing this and for inviting me to be here. It's one I wouldn't have missed for the world. I think this series is such a fantastic idea. I don't know of any department that actually celebrates the its faculty to the highest mm -hmm. research and scholarly and pedagogical ranks, and I think it's wonderful. And when I heard about it, well, I think probably the first thing I thought was, it's no surprise it's the Department of Communication that came up with this idea. <laughs> I've known many of you for many, many years. It's a department I've had a very close connection to for a long time. And it has really unqualifiably been a department in which I think people respect each other, they value each other's work, they talk to each other. And so I think this is a perfect place to have uh, a lecture series like this. And it's also wonderful to have Leah be the inaugural, inaugural speaker. <laughs> um, I, I, of course, read Leah's promotion file last winter, and it was, it was one of those where you know there's going to be about 30 seconds worth of discussion because it was so obvious that her scholarship and teaching and her commitment to public service are absolutely exceptional. And I think in some ways that the, um, the emphasis on public communication about science is really, it, it sort of blends all of those three. And it was very impressive, and I'm looking forward to hearing her reflections. So thank you. to Leah Ciccarelli, I've put together just a few remarks. Um, partly, I'm guessing, out of modesty, and partly so that I don't steal any of the biographical pieces that she plans to reference in her lecture. Leah asked me to provide a very brief introduction. So I wanted to say four things about her, which are from the perspective of a colleague. First, today is the day that her promotion to the rank of professor becomes official. <laughs> Second, Leah's scholarship um, and teaching are superb. They're top-notch, as good as it, we have in the department. She focuses on important things, she examines and talks about them in careful ways, and she seeks to bring them to people in accessible, creative ways. Third, Leah's commitment to the community is legendary. She has held countless work-intensive roles in the department, as currently as associate chair, and is taking on another one this fall as head of our pedagogy program for PhD students. In delivering her talk today, Leah makes another contribution to our community. Fourth, her students will run through walls for her, and that's because she pours herself into her mentoring. I've seen it, and I've heard plenty about it, including what's known as the Leah treatment, in reading their papers and providing feedback. It's a gift to people. They may not know it at the time, but it's a gift to people. 
I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Leah, and as you do, I want to step over here and grab a small memento of the department's appreciation um, in, to Leah and honoring this lecture itself. So, Professor Ciaccarelli. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, David. Thank you, Judy. Um, so I'm, as you know, I'm here today to inaugurate the inaugural lecture series with this, the inaugural, inaugural lecture. <laughs> and that, by the way, that's a rhetorical strategy that I just used there. <laughs> that is called traductio. Traductio is a figure of speech where you repeat the same word or its cognates multiple times in a single sentence. And I thought if I started the lecture with that mouthful of a traductio, that everything else would be a cinch from there. <laughs> so as David pointed out, the scheduling of today's lecture is perfect today because uh, this is the day when my promotion to full professor becomes real, official, and I'm guessing then that after the lecture, the rest of the full professors are going to teach me the secret handshake, right? You're gonna initiate me into the guild. That's why the, the, the dean is here, right? <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to getting the talk out of the way so that, that that can happen. Now, as I understand it, the genre of the inaugural lecture asks me to reflect upon how I got where I am today. Who influenced me? What paths I took on my intellectual journey? Unfortunately, I've served on the graduate admissions committee too many times to know to do that sort of thing without a bit of a shudder. Now, those of you who've served on the committee know what I'm talking about. You get to read countless uh, stories about how an applicant knew that he or she was fated for a career <laughs> in uh, communication from a very early age. Right? <laughs> I knew as soon as I won the Henry Greaves speech contest in sixth grade that I would someday be a speech professor. <laughs> or when I was just 10 years old, I organized all the kids on my block to write a newspaper for our neighborhood. And ever since, I knew that when I grew up, I'd be teaching future journalists in a department of communication. It's tedious to hear that kind of just so origin story when you're seeking something a little bit more intellectually satisfying. So I'm going to spare you that today. Well, except for those last two anecdotes, which are, in fact, events from my early life. <laughs> <laughs> That's another rhetorical strategy, by the way. That's called um, paralepsis, or sometimes uh, priteritio. It's saying something by saying you're not going to say something. <laughs> like uh, the political candidate who says, I'm not even going to mention my opponent's drinking problem. <laughs> That's true that hindsight is 2020. We get somewhere and we find ourselves looking back wiggishly on the path that we took and pronouncing, of course, we knew all along that that was exactly where we were headed. But real life is weaved out of chance encounters, <coughs> chance encounters and consider decisions that just accidentally turn out to be the right ones. I could just as easily be standing here today, uh, or standing today in, in, in front of a law firm, uh, looking back at my participation in high school debate and mock trial and saying, um, of course my career had been set there. Or I could be standing in an elementary school library extolling my early love of children's books. Or I could be at a real estate agency reasoning that really I've always known that I liked living with a roof over my head. <laughs> and doesn't that just prove that I was meant to sell houses to others who similarly like that? It was, in fact, a chance encounter. A chance encounter not long after I arrived at Berkeley from my freshman year of undergraduate work that introduced me to the field of rhetoric. I was walking by Dwinnell Hall. You remember Dwinnell Hall? It's a beautiful um, uh, old building. It has a huge courtyard filled with trees and benches. And I happened to run into a former student from my high school a couple of years ahead of me who had also come to Berkeley. And so I asked this upperclassman if he had any advice for me as I began my college career. 
And he suggested that I take rhetoric 1A for my composition requirement rather than English 1A or Comp Lit 1A or any of the other courses that would fill that gen ed writing slot in my schedule. He didn't know me very well, but he had a sense that I would like that class. And he was right. <laughs> rhetoric 1A, uh, I remember my teacher for that class, I don't remember his name, he was a lecturer or an instructor of record. Um, he's the one who introduced me for the first time to the close reading of texts. I recall one day when he opened Darwin's Origin of Species to a random page, and we moved through that page line by line, word by word, asking questions like, why did Darwin say it in that way and not another way? Or, what was his persuasive intent here? Or, what rhetorical strategies was he using here? I was hooked. Now, I didn't perform all that well in the class, like many of my classes in the first few, two years of my college career. I received like a B minus, C plus, but I sure did enjoy that class. And so when it was over, I asked the teacher what other courses I could take at the university that would allow me to continue along this intellectual path. And so he directed me to a course in the English department on the early English novel. He said, I think you'll like this course. Boy, was he wrong. <laughs> it was the worst course I had ever taken. Now, before then, I had never met a piece of fiction that I didn't like. But novels like um, Maul Flanders and Pamela and Camilla and a bunch of others about the misfortunes of 18th century women and their imperiled virtue, they were just about as dull as you can get. And to top it all off, the professor in that class didn't understand a thing about rhetoric. He kept asking, what motivated the character to do what she did? And I kept wanting to say, what kind of a question is that? <laughs> you should be asking why the author wrote the main character in that way. Right? Every text is persuasively designed by a rhetor to achieve some purpose. I learned that last quarter, last semester, <laughs> from my brother professor. As I look back on it, I think that my first rhetoric teacher might have directed me to that class on the early English novel because he thought, hey, she's a woman, right? I bet she'd like a course where all the readings are about women. <laughs> and so my future career as a scholar of rhetoric almost came to an end right there on the sexist assumption of one of my male, many male college teachers. So after taking that um, course in the early English novel, I decided to dig in and pursue another path that I was on toward a degree in biology. And that meant enrolling in a lot of weeder classes in chemistry, <laughs> classes that were also really, really dull. <laughs> but at least they seemed to be leading me to the prospect of future employment. <laughs> my parents were solidly middle class. At the time, my dad was a K-12, K-12 educator turned administrator, and my mom worked accounts payable at a bank. And although they'd never insist that I take a particular set of courses, um, I think I'd soaked up either from them or from sort of a cultural belief that surrounded me that if you're smart enough to do well in STEM courses, you're wasting your parents' hard-earned mon hard money by not taking them. Um, but I really wasn't enjoying those chemistry classes. Not as much as I'd enjoyed that first rhetoric class. So after a couple of years, I decided to take a part-time job at a credit union. Now back then, the state supported education. Right? They supported it to the extent that a student could actually pay her own college tuition and living expenses if she worked really hard and lived frugally. I, didn't, I did not amass debt as a student, and I did it for my, um, after those first two years, I did it on my own. And once I was doing it on my own, once I was paying my own bills, I figured, you know what? I can return and take those rhetoric classes in good conscience. Um, <laughs> it was my money. So I enrolled in a class from the humanist rhetorician Thomas Sloan, where I learned about terms like prioritio. Um, I got an A minus in his class, which was enough to be hired by him the following year as an undergraduate tutor, which is sort of like a TA to the TAs and IORs who were teaching public speaking and oral interpretation of literature. Um, I also took a course from Art Quinn, whose book 
Figures of Speech, 60 Ways to Turn a Phrase, mm -hmm. is still in print today, 15 years after his death. I'll always remember him reading segments of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire to us to demonstrate how style and content can cooperate to develop a larger meaning for a text. Now, while I was taking those classes, I never stopped pursuing my biology major. It seemed wasteful to give up on that goal after going so far along that path. But I decided to add a second major in rhetoric, which meant adding a fifth year to my undergraduate career. Again, this was something that the economics of higher education allowed at that time. It's a little harder to do that today. Around the middle of my first senior year, a friend invited me to join the news department at the ca uh, student campus uh, radio station, student-run campus radio station. The first day I showed up to the newsroom, the student who was running the show that day gave me a press release about an ancient frog that had, a scientist had discovered frozen in amber. He told me to write up that story for radio. And I thought, oh, I can do this. I've taken all these rhetoric courses. I know how to write. No problem. <clears throat> but after handing him my version of the story, he took a red pin to it and tore it to pieces. I buried the lead. My sentences were too long. There were reams of material that was unnecessary to the story. Now, I wouldn't say that it was love at first sight, but it was certainly respect at first sight. That producer who tore up my first story uh, would eventually become my spouse. <laughs> Within six months of stepping into that newsroom for the first time, I advanced from copywriter to reporter to anchor to engineer to producer and eventually to assistant news director. I think Tim was impressed by that, and so we started dating. <laughs> At the time, I briefly toyed with the idea of going into the news business. With a double major in rhetoric and biology, I could probably be a science journalist. But when I was honest with myself, I had to admit that what I most enjoyed about working for the radio station was teaching other students how to write better stories, as Tim had done for me. I didn't really enjoy the practice of journalism itself. So I was still searching for a career, and um, I gave science one last try the summer after my first senior year. Uh, at that summer uh, when I worked in a biology lab at Yale University. Now the lab was run by my aunt, Diane Barber, and we were experimenting on cells from the submucosal layer of the intestine of dogs. <laughs> now I, I did in fact discover something really important that summer in my, my studies in the lab. It wasn't a new chemical pathway or a bold new scientific theory. What I discovered was that most of the daily work of cell biology is cooking <laughs> with nasty chemicals and without the benefit of getting to eat what you prepare. <laughs> uh, dog intestines are just about as gross as you might expect them to be. So I'll always be thankful for that experience because it helped me to discover that the actual practice of science also really wasn't for me. The first time that I entertained the idea of becoming a professor of rhetoric was when I took a course from Todd Willey on the rhetoric of imperialism. Now it was a big class, there were like 70 students or more in there, so the professor didn't really get to know the students. Uh, the paper that I wrote for that class was on Rudyard Kipling, and I remember struggling with that paper a little bit. I had a phone conversation with my uncle, Richard Ellis, the day before the paper was due. Now he's a really smart um, defense attorney who argues death penalty cases uh, all across the country, and he, he likes to read postmodern theory for fun. <laughs> Something he said must have really gotten me on the right track because I got that paper together by the time it was due. On the day of that final the final exam in that class, what Professor Willie did was he uh, fanned out the papers that were graded now on the front table, and we were supposed to come up and pick them up before we left the room. As I picked up my paper, Professor Willie looked at me and said, Ah, you're the one. <laughs> He'd been on the lookout there to connect my face with my name for the first time on the last day of class. <laughs> uh, 
when, when I looked at his remarks on the paper, I figured out why he wanted to know who I was. It was, was good news. <laughs> he had actually given me an A plus on the paper and suggested that I turn it in to, uh, for publication in an undergraduate publication uh, journal. Now, I didn't do that, uh, but I did consider there, for the first time, a career as a rhetorician. After all, I knew that I liked teaching, and now it looked like I could actually write a pretty decent research paper if I put my mind to it. That idea, then, that I could become a, a professor of rhetoric um, got morphed just a little bit uh, when I took a course for the first time uh, on the subject of rhetoric of science. Now, I, I was fortunate to be able to take a course from the famous physicist turned feminist science study scholar, Evelyn Fox Keller. She had just joined the rhetoric department at Berkeley, and uh, so I was taking her class. I remember one day after class, she called me and one other student into her office after class. Um, and she asked us, what is this thing rhetoric anyway? <laughs> now that did not inspire me with a lot of confidence. <laughs> she was the one who was supposed to be teaching us rhetoric. But as it turned out, there really wasn't a shared understanding of that term in the department at the time, and he, she just really wanted to know what we undergraduates thought it was. So I was really lucky to have her as a teacher because a passing remark that she made in class one semester ended up, that semester, ended up um, setting the stage for what really became the most significant research finding of my career. She mentioned that a 1944 book by the Nobel Prize winning physicist Erwin Schrodinger was highly influential in getting young physicists to turn to the study of biology. And many of those physicists turned biologists would go on to lead the revolution in uh, molecular biology that happened in the middle of the 20th century. But the, the really weird thing was the book that inspired them, this book by Schrodinger, um, was fatally flawed as a scientific text. It got most of its <laughs> biology wrong, and even some of its physics was wrong. <laughs> So isn't that weird? Now, I didn't think about it much at the time, but I dutifully wrote it down in my notebook. Those of you who've seen me uh, in lectures know that I'm constantly taking notes. And fortunately, I kept that notebook, and I came back to it later. Um, so when the time came then to apply to graduate schools, I decided I, maybe I will pursue this career in, in rhetoric. I, I only sent materials to two programs. I sent it to UC Berkeley and to Northwestern. And that was because I asked my advisor, my rhetoric advisor, where I could go to study the kind of thing that I was studying there. And he said, there is no place like Berkeley. Now that was pretty scary. But I didn't want to put all my eggs in one basket, so I took it upon myself to figure out where the most professors in the Department of Rhetoric at Berkeley had gotten their degrees. And I saw that there were about four or five of them who had gone to Northwestern. That was the biggest uh, grouping. Um, of course, they'd gone about 30 years previously, <laughs> so I was taking a risk there, but I thought maybe it would still be a good place to study. I had no idea at the time that their grad program in rhetoric was ranked by the uh, NCA reputational survey as number one. No, no sense at all of that. As it turned out, I did not get into the UC Berkeley graduate program. Um, I don't feel too bad because the valedictorian that year did not get into the UC Berkeley <laughs> graduate program. They were dead set against accepting any of their own. But fortunately, I did get into Northwestern with full funding into their MA PhD program and a first year fellowship to sweeten the deal. Now, I still marvel at the fact that they accepted me on the basis of so little information from me. I'd written a one page personal statement, and that was it. It was that, right? And uh, letters of recommendation, GRE scores, and, and uh, a GPA. It was all they had. Um, I, on that one-page statement, I wrote some gobbledygook about wanting to study the rhetoric of science and the science of rhetoric. Right? Nice anti-metaboly there. You guys know what anti-metaboly anti is? Uh, anti-metaboly. It's when you have the balanced uh, uh, phrases uh, where they're, the, the, they're reversed. Um, but it was meaningless. <laughs> it was a beautiful sounding statement that meant nothing, right? Because rhetoric is not a science. Uh, it's an art. Uh, you could say it's a branch of scholarship in the humanities, but it's not really a science. 
unfortunately, they overlooked that. <laughs> they accepted me anyway. When Tom Goodnight called to give me the offer, I accepted it on the spot. It was a great deal, and I didn't want him to figure out his mistake. <laughs> Fortunately for me, they signed someone else that year, too. They signed uh, Mike Leff, uh, hired him as a full professor in uh, the department. Now, I would come to discover that the kind of work that Professor Leff did really spoke to me. Leff was a close reader of texts with a deep understanding of the rhetorical tradition. Light bulbs went on for me every time he spoke and every time I read something that he wrote. Now, I'd chosen Michael Hyde as my advisor for my MA thesis. And he's a, he's a professor who does uh, work on the rhetoric of medicine. And I reasoned, well, rhetoric of medicine is a close cognate to rhetoric of science. And so his area is kind of close to mine. Um, but Mike Leff was really the professor whose work <coughs> spoke to me. It clicked for me. So by the time I started the PhD portion of my program, I'd come to understand that a good advisor-advisee relationship has more to do with style of thinking than it does with specific subject matter. And Leff agreed, and agreed to serve as my advisor from then on out. Now there's um, one other professor that I just want to mention here. I think I can't overlook uh, his early influence. Um, both my thesis and a portion of my dissertation were derived from a paper that I'd written for a rhetoric of science class that I was fortunate enough to take from John Angus Campbell. Um, it, was, uh, it was taken at Northwestern. Uh, at the time, John Angus Campbell was a professor at UW, but the Van Zelst family had left an endowment to Northwestern that paid a selected visiting scholar <laughs> each year to come in and give, uh, uh, to teach for a quarter there. And Campbell had been selected to come the previous year to Northwestern, but for a personal reason, he had to delay his visit. And that was really fortunate for me because then the, the year he did come was my first year at Northwestern. So I got to take a class from him. When brainstorming the topic for the paper for that class, I revisited that notebook from Evelyn Fox Keller's <coughs> class. And I rediscovered that matter of Schrodinger's bizarre success. That would then be my research question for the class. Uh, that paper that I wrote for the class was further developed into my MA thesis. Then later, I added a second case study of a book by a guy named Theodosius Sibchansky that had a similar effect on scientists, and I wrote my dissertation. And a few years after that, with further development and the addition of a third case study, uh, this time of a book by uh, biologist E.O. Wilson that failed in its attempt to do the same sort of thing as those other two texts did. Um, with that, I turned that initial research question uh, into my first book. The larger question that drove me during that time of my career, a question that was seated in that undergraduate class with Evelyn Fox Keller, was how scientists motivate their colleagues to cross disciplinary boundaries. Now, as someone who had herself been moving between and across these disciplinary boundaries, um, it seemed right that my research should be on that subject. What I discovered from my close reading of Schrodinger's text and later confirmed with my close reading of Dubchansky's text and then Wilson's text was that interdisciplinary research was most effectively initiated through strategies of polysemy. You know that word? A polysemic text is a text that has multiple meanings. It speaks differently to different interpretive communities. Polysemic texts can motivate people from those different communities to take a risk on a new line of research by persuading each community that that collaborative action is actually in their best interest. Texts that deployed those strategies didn't have to be scientifically accurate in all of their particulars. They just had to be rhetorically persuasive and, of course, they had to be right about their ultimate prediction that work in that interdisciplinary space would, space would be productive. That nudge that had gotten me going along that research path to make this discovery was just a passing remark uh, by a professor in an undergrad class. Such passing remarks would shape my early career. For example, when I defended my dissertation proposal, a question from one of my committee members got me started on a critical practice that became one of my trademarks in the field of rhetorical criticism. 
this was Ken Alder, a historian of science who was on my committee, and he asked me why I was making claims about how audiences uh, were reading Schrodinger's text and, and Dovchansky's text, but then I wasn't actually looking at how the audience did, in fact, read those texts. It was common practice at the time for close readers in rhetoric to focus almost exclusively on a primary text. But Professor Alder really had a point. There was a lot of evidence out there about how audiences actually had interpreted those texts, if you knew where to look for that evidence. Now, when you're doing an analysis of a book, for example, you can go read book reviews. Uh, or you can look at how people have talked about the book in their own autobiographies or in letters that they wrote to friends. Or you could look at the marginalia that they wrote uh, in their copy of the book. Um, so there's a lot of this, or, or you could even look at how they cite it in their own research. What, how are they, what do they understand it to mean uh, when they, they're citing that book? So um, I added a close reading of all of this kind of reception evidence to my close reading of the primary texts. And I uh, coined a new term for that kind of critical practice. I called it the close textual intertextual analysis. And in my dissertation and later in my book and then also in a couple of articles, I advocated for others to adopt that critical practice as well. And I think some have. Another passing remark by my dissertation committee led to yet another one of my most um, significant contributions of my early career. During the defense of my dissertation, my committee pointed out that I'd done a fine job of demonstrating the polysemic strategies in these texts and, and how they were taken up by audiences. But I really hadn't done much with uh, polysemy itself as a theory. What is polysemy anyway, they asked. They made me add a couple of pages to the <coughs> dissertation reviewing theories of polysemy before they'd sign off. And I did that dutifully in the day or two after the dissertation was defended. I, I went and added my two pages. And it satisfied them. But it didn't satisfy me. So after completing the dissertation, I decided to write an article on the concept. My more thorough review of that term found that rhetorical <coughs> scholars were, ironically enough, <coughs> using the term polysemy in different ways within the literature. So I wrote an article that clarified what polysemy meant to rhetorical theory. And it became my single most cited article in the field. So as I look back over my career, it seems that all of my early contributions, right, my study of the interdisciplinary inspirational scientific text, my practice of close textual intertextual analysis, and my study of polysemy, all of these things were sparked by questions that were asked to me by my professors. So a piece of advice to you graduate students out there, pay close attention to the questions that your professors ask. You can spin them into research gold. <laughs> um, David Donkey talked this morning about the importance of relationship to the faculty and staff, that is talking with the smart people around you rather than just isolating yourself to get your work done. And this is, an, this is evidence that that really works. You really need to hear what others say in order to know what to do with your own work. So um, after that, after my uh, uh, um, dissertation, I was fortunate to be able to start my professorial career at Penn State University. Um, I was still ABD, actually, uh, and they took a risk and hired me to an open tenure track position that they had there. Now, you don't see that happening much anymore. Uh, but I was very fortunate, and I think it really helped there that I was a woman because almost all of the faculty in, in the speech communication department at the time there were men, and they really needed to diversify a bit. Whatever the reason behind their hiring decision, it was the perfect job for me. I had a number of colleagues to listen to and to bounce ideas off of. Almost half the faculty in the speech communication department there were rhetoricians, and there were at least as many rhetoricians over in the English department, and the grad students there were great. The only problem with Penn State was that it was located smack dab in the middle of the state of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Now, Tim and I had kept up a long-distance relationship during all throughout my time in graduate school. And now, with my first tenure track job, we were going to have to continue our time apart, it looked like. right? He worked in broadcast news at the time. 
and middle of the nowhere Pennsylvania is just not a place for him to get a job. Uh, he could not find a job there. There was no television station anywhere near State College, Pennsylvania. Um, so after a little over a year at Penn State, I applied for a job here at UW. Uh, the TV station where Tim worked at the time in Sacramento, California, uh, they owned a station here in Seattle too, so he thought he could probably get transferred if he asked. John Angus Campbell had just left UW for a job at the University of Memphis. And so his line was open here. So I applied for it. And I did not get the first offer. <laughs> but the guy who did get the first offer declined. <laughs> and so it was offered to me. <laughs> and I took it eagerly. <laughs> uh, Tim and I got married soon after we moved here. And a few years later, we had a boy, Kyler, and then a girl, Serafina. Now, Kyler is 12 now. And Serafina is about to turn 10. And they're both just really great kids. Uh, Kyler is a computer whiz who writes code in three different computer programming languages. Um, he's already surpassed the knowledge and skill of the uh, programming tutor that we hired for him last summer. So we need to figure out what to do next. Um, Serafina is a little mini me. But she is the new and improved S model. <laughs> more beautiful, more talented, more popular than I ever was. <laughs> and to think, if I hadn't gotten the job here, I don't know that they would exist today. So talk about your accidental good decisions. Um, after I got tenure at UW, I started a second line of research on the public communication of scientists. My first line of research had been on how scientists communicate with each other but across disciplinary boundaries. My second would look at how scientists communicate outside of their disciplines to a non-scientific audience. Now rhetoric is a field of scholarship that traditionally looks at communication in the public sphere. So research on the public rhetoric of scientists would seem to be a no-brainer. But in its early years, the newly developing field of rhetoric of science had been so busy scratching a place for itself out of the uh, a uh, larger field of science studies, so busy trying to prove that the prototypical scientific research article was in fact rhetorically constructed, that the easier case of uh, looking at the public rhetoric of scientists had been largely neglected. Over in the field of mass communication journalism research, science communication scholars were developing a robust line of scholarship on mediated public messages about science. But they were doing uh, very little work on what scientists say when they communicate directly to the public in the form of speeches or books that were written for popular audiences. So I decided to do some work on the public address of scientists. My first article in this genre was a piece that I wrote for the journal Written Communication on the speeches of geneticists uh, Francis Collins and Craig Venter at the White House ceremony in 2000, year 2000, celebrating the near completion of the Human Genome Project. Now what struck me right away about those speeches was the number of mixed metaphors in them. <laughs> in the same breath, the genome was being described as both a map and as a blueprint, as both a code and a text. Now my first thought was these metaphors are contradictory, right? A map records the contours of a place that already exists, while a blueprint is aspirational, setting a plan for something that humans will then go on to build. A code is something that can be decoded to reveal a pretty straightforward message, but a text tends to be more polysemic, uh, subject to different interpretations by different readers. Hypothetically, a genome that was imagined as both map and blueprint, as both code and text, is being imagined in multiple and complex ways, as something that's both deterministically set, but also as something that might be altered and rebuilt, uh, as something that uh, both can both be decoded in a straightforward manner to understand the message inside, but also as something that can be reinterpreted under different conditions seem pretty interesting. But after taking a closer look at the speeches, I came to see that the mixed metaphors really weren't as multifaceted as I'd originally hoped. 
the way that they interacted with each other in the context of the speeches actually resolved the mixed metaphors to their least common denominators. The map that was being imagined in these speeches was actually the Lewis and Clark survey map designed for conquest of a territory. So it carries a lot of the same entailments that you find in a blueprint. It's designed to help people develop something for future use and profit. And the genomic text that was being described in these speeches was actually uh, not a piece of poetry that you could interpret in different ways, but an instruction manual. Right? An instruction manual isn't open to interpretation. It's meant to be read in a straightforward manner to assist in the achievement of a specific goal, just like a coded message might be. Scientists were thus using mixed metaphors that theoretically had the potential to capture the real complexity of a subject, but they were using them in a way that resolved into an oversimplification of the subject matter and an overly hopeful vision of the benefits of their research. So after publishing that article on mixed metaphors uh, in that, those genomic speeches, I started thinking more about that survey map metaphor. Because it sounded suspiciously like an imperialistic metaphor that E.O. Wilson had used in uh, one of the texts that I had examined in my first book. In his book, Consilience, Wilson had talked about the natural sciences taking a voyage of exploration into the social sciences to conquer territory that wasn't being productively developed by researchers who were already occupying that territory. This metaphor backfired on him, causing many social scientists and actually quite a few natural scientists to reject his attempt to promote that interdisciplinary field that he called sociobiology. The social scientists really didn't much like thinking of themselves as natives to be conquered. <coughs> And the natural scientists weren't all that thrilled about being seen as conquerors of the disciplinary territory of their colleagues across campus. So why had Wilson used that imperialist language in the first place? Well, now Wilson himself explained that he thought it would be a great way to inspire scientists. Right? Using a frontier metaphor that gave them faith in new undiscovered continents of knowledge awaiting their discovery seemed like a re good rhetorical tactic. And he's right that in an American context, that frontier myth has traditionally held a powerful persuasive force. We see that power being deployed by Collins and Venter, right, in those speeches in the White House with their survey map, Lewis and Clark map metaphor. So why was it that a scientist like Wilson was using the frontier metaphor so clumsily and ineffectively? And did Collins and Venter have any problems with their Lewis and Clark survey metaphor for genomic science, like Wilson had had with his imperialist metaphor? Those were the questions that led to my second book, which helped to secure my promotion to full professor. Now, that book is called uh, On the Frontier of Science, A Rhetoric of Exploration and Exploitation, and it'll be coming out on November 1st. In writing it, I found myself looking at the rhetoric of imperialism again like I had in that class long ago from Professor uh, Willie. The book, this book details how the frontier of science metaphor first appeared in the public address of American intellectuals and politicians in the early 20th century, and how the metaphor continues to be used to the, today in the speeches of scientists as they seek to um, gain research funding. It's a really ubiquitous metaphor, right? Once you start looking for it, you're gonna see it everywhere. And in the book, I asked what's selected and what's deflected by this metaphor? What effects does the metaphor have on those who use it? And what rhetorical moves are made by those who are trying to counter its influence? Now, among other things, I found that scientists are constituted through the frontier of science metaphor as stereotypically male, risk-taking, adventurous loners separated from a public that both, both envies and distrusts them with a manifest destiny to penetrate the unknown and a competitive desire to claim the riches of new territory before others can do the same. Now this is a problematic characterization, I think, of science in a post-colonial transnational context uh, where collaborative research is actually the norm uh, and where women, frankly, make up the majority of the pool of undergraduates from which future scientists are recruited. It's also a really problematic metaphor, I think, because when it's applied to biology, the matter 
being conceptualized as territory to be conquered and monetized, it isn't really vacant right? any more than the territory of the Americas were vacant when explorers of European descent began divvying it up. Through the frontier of science metaphor, we're led to think about the bodies of new species being studied as territory to be mined for its biological wealth. Or we're <laughs> encouraged to think of the microscopic interiors of people as territory to be mapped by experts who are trying to stake a claim to the promising new genetic sequences that they find there. In both cases, right, that what you, what you, have, what you neglect is uh, the people who own the land being mined for its biological wealth or the people whose bodies are being mapped in the genomic gold rush. Uh, those people have good reason then to object to such scientific activity. So one case that I look at uh, in this new book is, a, again, a case by E.O. Wilson. Uh, but this time I look at his environmentalist rhetoric where he argues that we need to engage in more biodiversity research to assist in the protection of endangered species. Now, in a couple of books that he wrote about this subject, he used a bioprospecting metaphor to excite people about this idea of biodiversity research, especially in the Amazon rainforest. But his bioprospecting arguments were vigorously opposed by Brazilians who didn't much like thinking of their land as territory to be prospected or mined by foreign scientists. Uh, another case that I discuss in the book is the uh, biocolonialism that Francis Collins implied with his promotion of genomics research in a, a number of uh, speeches and books uh, and even a, um, an editorial that he wrote for the Seattle Times. Uh, his way of framing genomics as a frontier adventure might have in fact contributed to the antagonism that many American Indians continue to have towards genomic research. Uh, and then I have another chapter in the book where I look at George W. Bush's efforts to overcome the progressive assumptions of the frontier myth when he tried to justify his policy on stem cell research, a policy that in fact closed a new frontier of research, right, by drawing a boundary line across which scientists were not allowed to pass. So in the book, I look uh, closely at the public address of scientists and also a few politicians as well as fragments of audience reception of those texts to show how the frontier of science metaphor guides scientific research in particular ways and sometimes blocks scientists from achieving the very goals that they seek to achieve with that rhetoric. Um, I frame my analysis of this frontier of science metaphor as a way of helping scientists to recognize when their rhetorical strategies aren't working and why. And that's, I think, a very important part of my current research in this field. When rhetoric of science was first forming as a field of study, back when I was still a student, we were considered a critical thorn in the side of science. Rhetoric of science was really initiated as sort of a postmodern challenge that reveals how science doesn't live up to its idealistic standards, but is guided by mere rhetoric instead. And this orientation, I think, helped to create this oppositional relationship between science and the field of rhetoric. But my own life history as someone who respects both science and rhetoric had encouraged me to develop a more supportive relationship between the two. Um, one other way that I've tried to do this is through a line of research on manufactured scientific controversy. About five years ago, I coined that term manufactroversy uh, to talk about a rhetorical strategy that politically motivated agents to, uh, uh, used to undermine mainstream science with the appearance of a heated scientific debate about a subject that actually enjoys a near scientific consensus. For example, those who oppose global warming science and those who support intelligent design creationism have developed manufactured controversies about climate change and evolution, respectively. In doing so, they take advantage of journalistic balancing norms and appeals to democratic values to develop an argument that sci the science really isn't settled on these issues yet, so we need to, to discuss them. Um, this argument is designed to constrain scientists and supporters of the scientific mainstream from offering a response to such criticism, right? Because if scientists say, well, there is no scientific debate about these matters, then they're branded as dogmatic elitists who are trying to silence their opposition. 
So I've been studying the argumentative dynamics of this uh, rhetorical strategy, these manufacturer verses, in order to come up with solutions for scientists who are being hamstrung by the strategy. And doing that work, I really take a very supportive stance towards scientists, a stance that some rhetoricians are uncomfortable with my taking. Uh, in fact, the philosopher of science, Steve Fuller, who's always been a great supporter of my work and I of his, um, is appalled by this recent turn in my research. He's written a scathing critique uh, of an award-winning article that I wrote on manufactured scientific uh, controversy. Uh, his critique, along with my equally scathing response to his critique, uh, will be appearing in an upcoming issue of Rhetoric and Public Affairs. Now, uh, Professor Fuller's position doesn't really surprise me. He's spoken in defense of intelligent design creationism, and we simply disagree about the intellectual legitimacy and political good of that theory. Uh, but more importantly, we also dis disagree, I think, about who rhetoricians should be helping with our research. He asks rhetoricians to persistently occupy the role of the gadfly, helping sophists to make the weaker case appear stronger in the public sphere. It's my position that it's in the best interest of rhetoricians to also offer, on occasion, some supportive advice to scientists who are having a hard time making the rationally stronger case actually appear stronger <laughs> before public audiences. <laughs> now, I would never claim that we should serve as defenders of science in every case, right? Anyone who's read my critiques of E.O. Wilson's sociobiology arguments or my more recent critiques of his uh, biodiversity arguments knows that I can blast scientists with the best of them. Poor Wilson, he's become my whipping boy. <laughs> uh, but I also acknowledge that there are times when scientists are more worthy of our support than their detractors are, especially when those detractors are operating from a closed-minded religious stance or when those detractors are ideologically motivated to question science because it's in their financial interest to do so. And when it comes right down to it, even with Wilson, my whipping boy, I've always offered my critique in a sincere spirit of reform, knowing that if he, or more likely his acolytes, could develop a more rhetorically sensitive set of arguments, they might have more success in achieving the most laudable of their goals, things like promoting the uh, work in the space between the social sciences and the physical sciences, or promoting biodiversity research and uh, the, the preservation of species. So um, I'm gonna continue to do this kind of work as a full professor now, um, helping scientists to improve their rhetoric across the boundary, separating disciplinary knowledge from public knowledge, and helping them to parse and respond to the ingenious rhetoric of uh, well-funded, politically inspired detractors. Um, I might also do some more research, I'm thinking, on how political leaders talk about science. So for example, I have a piece that I'm just starting to work on now about how George W. Bush characterized the ethos of scientists when he was president. And I, I'm finding, you know, he's, he was all over the map. Uh, sometimes he called them scientists. Scientists were prophets of a better age who embody American, America's pioneering spirit. Uh, at other times, they're confused controversialists, <laughs> plagued with uncertainty, and at yet other times, they are immoral evildoers who have to be constrained from taking America down a dark and dangerous path. Um, so I'm, I, I, I'm gonna look and see if I can find some way of reconciling the way that he presents them in his speeches. Um, but beyond that particular work that I've already started, the other specific cases that I study in the future will depend critically on what questions seep up from my previous work as well as from the passing remarks of the people around me. Right? I'll always do work on the rhetoric of science and especially on the, how the boundaries between disciplines or between disciplinary and extra disciplinary space are negotiated and crossed. Um, but uh, for the most part, I'm gonna rely on chance encounters and, and good decisions that act, you know, considered decisions that accidentally turn out to be really good ones um, to fill in the details of which particular study I take on at any moment in time. It's worked, it's worked for me so far, I think it'll work for me in the future, and so on that note, I plan to listen very carefully to your comments and suggestions after my talk, <laughs> right? Because it's those sorts of offhand remarks and questions that will in fact spark the next, next phase of research that I do. 
And then, after hearing your ideas, if I've satisfied the conditions of the inaugural genre, I'll look to my full professor colleagues to teach me that secret handshake, <laughs> to inaugurate me into their ranks. Thank you.